Good morning, Allegheny West family. It's great to see you here again this Sabbath morning. Um, this has been about the fifth week that we've been out of church, and I'm looking forward to the time when we can just all get back together in our individual church communities and worship with one another and our Lord. And so we just want to thank you so much for all that you have done with us and for us through these five weeks. Uh, let us bow our heads and pray. Our Heavenly Father, Thank you once again for the blessings that you've provided for the Allegheny West family. For those who are listening in, we ask, Father, that you will continue to extend mercy and grace to all of us. Now, once again, please take your manservant and hide me safely and securely behind the cross of Calvary so that only Jesus Christ may be seen, felt, and heard. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I should have known that there was something different about this day. It was one of the most unusual days of my life. And I knew that it was going to be something different from the time that I began. I woke up early that morning before the sun had even arisen. See, there was this bird, and it, and it just flew up to the window and sat on the sill and started singing. At first, it kind of disturbed me, and I was wondering why would a bird be singing that early in the morning, but to my uh, benowns, I, I, I just was just kind of upset. But as I began talking and listening and looking, the bird just kept singing and singing and singing, and as he sang, he sang until the sun rose. Uh, for many of you, that may have not been anything unique or different. But for me, it was the first time in my life that I ever saw the sun rise. The sun came up early, and it was one of the most beautiful things that you could see in your life. I had never seen a sunrise before, but it caught my attention to the bird. This bird that was still singing, it, it glistened, it was shining, it was, it was white, and, and I wanted to know what was, kind of bird was this. And, and it just kept singing and singing and singing, and, it was started to get on my nerves, to be quite frank and honest about it, but um, I just went over to the windowsill. I, I thought the bird would leave, but it just sat there and continued to sing song after song. And, and it began to play melodies in my head that I had never really understood or heard before. And eventually I tapped on the window to try to shoo the bird away. And um, it kind of looked at me and gave a note and then flew off. Um, I was about to get back in bed, but I should have known it was going to be something different about this day. Um, about the time I got in bed and got ready to pull the covers back over my head to just catch a few more hours of sleep, you know, really hours, I was going to sleep some more. And what happened is my mother walked through the door. She sat down with me on the side of my bed and she began to ask me questions. She said, why didn't you go out last night? And, you know, I thought she was trying to be kind of sarcastic and, you know, just sort of be probing. You know how mothers are. Mothers can kind of get on your nerves and get in your business. And I really didn't want to answer her. And she said, really, um, William, why didn't you go out last night? And I said, well, Mom, look, I, I just felt tired. Um, I didn't feel like going out. She said, but you always go out with your friends, Michael and Shelton and you, 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 you didn't go out with them last night, and I was just kind of curious as to why you didn't go. And I said, ah, Mom, look, can you just leave a brother alone? I'm trying to get some rest. And she says, well, I have some bad news for you. I should have known it was going to be something different about this day. She said, um, Mike and Shelton were um, hurt very bad last night. Mike was actually killed, and Shelton is in serious condition. He's critical at the hospital. And I sat up and looked, because usually I am out with them. We're like the three musketeers, the three amigos. We do everything together. But that night before, I just decided I'm going to stay in. Mike, Sheldon, go do your thing. I do mine. And they went on about their way. And I asked, well, what happened? What happened? And she said, look, um, they broke into um, Mr. Simeon's store. And he didn't know who it was. And he came down and he shot Mike and killed him. And Shelton is in critical condition. And the doctors don't know if he's going to make it through. 
And I know you hang out with them. Is that what you all normally do? Well, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to indict myself. I'm not going to say something and get myself in, in trouble. So I just sort of stared at her and looked at her in dismay. Um, tears started to flow from my eyes very softly. And I just wanted everything to go away. I just wanted that day to be over. But I knew something was different about that day. Well, I got up start to get dressed. I decided, well, I'm going to talk to mom some more. You know, mom is pretty cool if you get to get her to talk. And uh, I just said, hey, mom, you know, um, are, you, are you really serious about Mike and Shelton? Are you really serious about what happened to them? And she said, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I still want to know why you didn't go with them last night. Uh, but, well, I sat there and looked around, and as I was looking on the table, there was this flyer about the preacher. He had just come into town to do a revival, and I looked at it, and I said, well, it can't go hurt to listen to a preacher. So I figured, hey, mom is always in the church. Let me ask her. So I said, hey, mom, um, I think I want to go hear the preacher. Would you go with me? Would you... Uh, be by my side? Would you go with a brother to help him out? And she looked at me and she said, well, I really don't have time today. Um, the girls and I, we're going to have a little party in just a few moments. And um, I just got some things I need to do. So now you go on if you want. And I was thinking, well, hey, you always in the church. You're always telling me to go to church. Now a brother's trying to go to church and now you're telling me uh, don't go that you can't go with me. And so I began to get a little discouraged and frustrated. I actually took the flyer up, balled it up, threw it in the trash and thought no more about it. But then I heard that bird singing again. Something about that bird, it just kept messing with me. It kept singing in my ears. It kept putting, seemed the, the songs would turn into words. And I began to get disturbed and troubled. And I thought maybe mm, I'm gonna go listen to the preacher anyway. So I asked mom just one more time. I said, hey, mom, look, um, I just want you to go with me. I feel a little uncomfortable. Would you just come? And she says, look, I'm not going. I got things to do. I told you I got friends coming over and just going about your business. And I said, well, hey, mom, can, can, can I get some bus fare? Can I get something? Can I get, no, I'm not giving you anything. You're always looking for something. I thought that was rather kind of cruel and bad simply because she had already asked me about whether or not I was with my friends. Um, I thought she really did care, but it seemed that she didn't. At least that's the way I felt. And, and, and so she looked at me and she went into the refrigerator and she grabbed some food and she threw it in the bag and she said, here, you can take this, go on about your day. And I, I was just disturbed. and. So I figured I'll go talk to dad. Dad's a, you know, dad's a deacon in the church and he always sits on the front row and whenever the preacher would begin to preach, he would be the one that would be on the front row saying, go on preacher, preach. He would be the one that would be amen, hallelujah. Uh, I, I, I thought certainly he would want to go hear the preacher since he was a deacon. And so I asked him and I went and said, dad, hey, look, would you please come with me? I'm thinking about going to listen to this preacher tonight. Would you come with me? And he looked at me and said a few explicitives. And I, and I looked at him, I was shocked. You know, why would you talk like that? Especially if I'm asking you, would you go to church? And you're a deacon after all, why would you do that? And I just became discouraged and I just sat down and I decided, I ah, just, going to listen to the preacher thing, going to a revival, going to a church. What's that all about? I'm not trying to hear that. I'm not trying to do that. Look at the people around me. Mom doesn't want to go and she considers herself to be all this church lady stuff. And, and dad, look at him. He figures, hey, you know, he's the deacon. He can shout, but I, I guess it was really all for show. And so I sat down, but then it was that bird again. It was sitting now on the outside window of the kitchen. And, and, and it kept singing, it just kept doing its thing. And it, it, it kept pulling me and I decided, all right, 
I'm going to listen to the preacher. So I just grabbed that bag that she put. I didn't even look in it. I just grabbed it, started out the door, headed down the road. And the first person I ran into was Simeon. Now, I wasn't really thrilled about Simeon because Simeon's parents, well, they were kind of snooty. Uh, they talked about people. They, they looked at you and they always considered me to be a drug addict. I wasn't a drug addict. I didn't take no drugs. I didn't drink anything. I didn't, I didn't go any place that, well, let me stop. I guess I did. Maybe they were right, but uh, they didn't have to say it. And, and Simeon, he wasn't all too much better himself. He hid it from them very well. Simeon, C was strung out on drugs. That brother get high all day long. He would just go in the house and he could fake it real well where his parents didn't even realize what was going on with him. And as I was going, something was saying to me, ask Simeon to go. And I'm not trying to feel Simeon. You know, I had already got a bad reputation. His parents already thought I wasn't worth anything. And if something happened to Simeon, sure, they're going to blame it on me. I mean, after all, Michael and Shelton, they got shot. And, and I usually hang out with them so they would determine, hey, is really you who causing all this trouble? So I'm not trying to talk to Simeon, but I decided, hey, I'm going to talk to Simeon and, and I'm going to deal with him. And as we, I went up to him, I said, hey, hey, Simeon, um, would you like to um, go with me to hear a preacher? And, you know, Simeon kind of starting to get high, like, yeah, brother, that, that, that'll be cool, man. I, I, I like maybe to go hear a little bit of preacher myself, man. Um, I think that's a good thing. And I was like, oh, boy, I ain't trying to feel this all day. And I decided maybe I'll just leave Simeon behind. But Simeon said, hey, man, just wait a few. I think I'm going to go grab a couple of things, man. Take a brother with you. Hey, church can't hurt nobody. You know, church is a good thing. Everybody ought to go to church. Isn't that right? And I just looked at him and decided, you know, why would I want to deal with a brother who's strung out? Why would I want to deal with somebody who gets high early in the morning? And so I just decided, hey, I'm going to try to leave Simeon. But the brother really wanted to go. What was I to do? without to leave him there all by himself. And so uh, I really didn't walk with him. I just be honest. I tried to stay a little bit ahead of him so he couldn't catch up with me. But, but Simeon kept talking and I just kept asking Simeon, how'd you get strung out, man? I was just experimenting now, man. I'm not really high. I mean, I just, I was just trying to, you know, just keep up with everybody else and just try to, you know, get into this thing. And, now, man, I just kind of needed to keep going, but I'm going I'm to get off of it, though, man. I'm going to get off of it. I'm going to get off of it. And I said, yeah, that's right. I, I, I heard that before. Um, and so we kept going. And the next thing I, I did, I, I came down and I saw Jill. Now, you have to understand, Jill is the kind of person you really don't want to be with. Jill, she is the kind of person that gets into all this philosophical stuff. She's always judgmental. Um, Jill is the kind of person that believes her agenda is the right agenda. L let me explain a little bit about Jill. Jill um, is on the far right agenda. And me, well, I'm on the far left agenda. Um, society calls me progressive and they call her conservative. She watches Fox, and I watch CNN. Um, she says that my views are liberal, and I tell her her views are um, the downfall of modern society, and her agenda tries to force people what to do. And so, you know, Jill and I, we just didn't get along. And, and I'm not trying to hear what's in my head. I am talking to Jill. Jill, do her thing. I do my thing. After all, I'm dealing with Simeon. That seems to be enough for anybody to have to deal with. But as I began to go down further, I actually passed by a house, but there was that bird. I should have known something was about that bird. That bird kept flying around and singing, and, and, and it almost like that bird was telling me, go back, go back, go back, go get Jill, go get Jill, go get Jill. And so 
I, I began to say, all right, I'm with Simeon. I really don't care to be around him. I, now you're asking me to be with Jill. I ain't trying to feel Jill. I'm trying to get away from her. But, but I paused for a moment. I was turned around. And just at the time I want, was about to ask Jill, do you want to go? At the same time, she said, where are you going? I said, well, if you really want to know, Jill, I'm going to um, hear this preacher. I hear he's pretty good, but, you know, if you want to go, come on. And she says, well, actually, I would. And I was amazed. Jill wants to hang with me, so I thought maybe I could get rid of her. I said, well, you know, Simeon is with us, and um, he's going to come, and he's going to be with us. And she looked at Simeon. She said, hey, I, I'll, I'll go with you. And Simeon said, well, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'm down. And she looks, and I look, and I'm saying, this is a motley crew. Jill, the conservative. William, the progressive. Simeon, the drug head. Wow. This is going to be an unusual day. But as we began talking on the way to listen to the preacher, we began to find out maybe we had some things in common. You know, young people trying to just deal with life, make it through life, find they have some things that are uh, not so different from everybody else. And so I began to talk with her and she began to share with me why she believed what she believed. I shared with her why I believe what I believed. And, Simeon just seemed to take it all in and every once in a while would just say, yeah, y'all some deep people, y'all some deep people. And so I began to recognize that maybe it wasn't anything too different than us. But I had one more person that I came in contact, Mr. Jones, he was my baseball coach. He was always telling me, get yourself together, get yourself together, stay on the right track, take care of yourself. Take care of your body. Don't get into any problems. Just work hard and work strong and you will make it. And so I decided, well, if anybody can go, I know it would be Mr. Jones. He always got something good to say. So I told Jill and Simeon, hey, hold on a moment. Let's go by Mr. Jones' house. I'm going to ask him if he wants to go. Um, you know, hey, the more the merrier. And when I knocked on his door and he opened it up, I saw... Miss Harriet, well, that's what we called her. She was really the English teacher, but it wasn't his wife. And my mouth dropped. I was upset. And I was like, Mr. Jones. And before I could say anything else, he said, look, you didn't see nothing. You didn't hear nothing. Go away. I got things I got to do. And I was like, Mr. And he slammed the door in my face. And I began to think, Ma, she's a hypocrite. She ain't trying to fill no church. She got better things to do. Dad, he act like he this uppity deacon sitting on the front row shouting amen, saying hallelujah, preach, preach, preach. But then when he's home, he's going to use all kinds of words that you can't even begin to, to explain. And, and, and so I'm just really upset. And now, Mr. Jones, my baseball coach, I really love that man. I thought he was something. But here he is with Miss Harriet. He's telling us, leave the girls alone. Don't be messed with them. And look what he's doing. So I have my head down. And when I turned off the porch, I was about to go back home. I said, this ain't worth this. All these people around me, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. I got this. Um, liberal person over here trying to act like they're trying to get to know me. And then I got Simeon. You don't know what he's going to do. Simeon may go off at any time. And so I decided maybe I'm going to turn around, go back home, call it a day. But it was that bird. That bird. I mean, it was bad enough that it was early in the morning where the bird woke me up. But then throughout the day, this bird just keeps coming and coming and coming. And, and I'm trying to like what, what, what's with this bird? And, and, and the bird, now the, the melody seems to almost be turning into words. Words like, I want to be free. Words that 
I, 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 I can't even begin to imagine in my head. They're just, they're just there. It seems like this bird is deeper than what a bird ought to be. And it, that bird was pesky. It was troublesome. But, but it just kept singing. It kept singing. And, and I turned around. And I said, come on, Jill. Come on, Simeon. Let's go. And as we began to walk, um, we saw other people. They were headed to the, 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 the church service as well. And so I decided... Yeah, wow, it seems like it's going to be a big crowd there tonight. But it was all these churchy people. I mean, you know what churchy people are. They, they kind of walk a little taller than everybody else. They um, kind of have a smile, but not a smile. I mean, these church people are, are different, but eh, I can deal with them for a couple of hours listening to the preacher. Um, after all, I knew it was something different about that day. And so when we got there, we got ready to move into the church. All of a sudden, the atmosphere changed. Now, you have to know me. I ain't trying to go up front. I'm not trying to get in the center of all that stuff. After all, I'm trying to figure out why am I really here? I'm starting to have doubts about why I came. But something just kept saying, go up front, go up front, go up front. You need to go up front. So, you know, I thought misery would love company. So I asked Jill and Sim, and they said, oh, no, nah, bro, we're going to stay back here, man. I just think I'll just stay, you know, it's kind of cool back here, if you know what I mean. And Jill's, you know, like, hey, you know, I'll, I'm going to stay back here. It's comfortable. Just chill. So I went up front. And as I got up front, you can begin to see that there was something different about what was going on. I mean, there was a buzz seemed to be all around the place. People were began telling a story. And I heard somebody say that this preacher can preach. This preacher knows how to deal with all kinds of people. Seems to be nice. He, he's not judgmental. He's not, he's not one who will tear you down. And so I felt begin to feel a little comfortable sitting up front. And, and, and as I began sitting, all of a sudden he started talking. Now you have to understand, I don't really listen to preachers. I don't know what the preacher at my church had been saying really. I mean, if I just be truthful. But what I began to understand and what I began to notice is that this preacher seemed to be looking at me, straight at me as he's preaching. I mean, I began to feel a little uncomfortable. I began to check around to see what's going on around me. But it seems like he was just talking to me. And he was saying things like, get yourself together. But the way he said it, it, it made me want to get myself together. He was saying things like, you know, if you just try harder, um, then you're, you're, you're hurting yourself. What you need to do is just let God take care of your problems. And that was a little different for what I was used to hearing. I was used to the preacher saying, if you do this, you're going to hell. If you do that, you'll go to heaven. But this preacher seemed to be saying that was all about getting to know the God of the universe, getting to understand what he was talking about, about his amazing grace and his amazing love and his amazing character. And, and, and I began listening to him, and, and, and then they paused. Service was over for that time. And I was like, well, that was pretty good. I mean, that was worth the while. It was nice. It was short. It was good. But then the people said, we got to um, keep on with the service. We can't let anybody leave and I was like what do you mean can't let anybody leave I'm going if I want to go but then it was that bird that bird was showing up in some of the strangest places singing some of the strangest songs at some of the strangest times it was just something different about this day but then I overheard the conversation it was seemed to be an argument between the preacher and the rest of the people around him and they were going at one another and and then in the midst of the argument it seemed like the preacher eyes snuck out and was looking at me 
And I'm like, why are you looking at me? I ain't got nothing to do with whatever y'all got going on up there. And then I heard somebody say, look, we really can't keep the people here. We didn't plan for this potluck. We didn't plan for anything going on. And so I was thinking, just me, just me, I was thinking they wanted this preacher to have something to eat. After all, I didn't know what was in my bag, but I decided that I would take the bag and that I would give it to the preacher to eat. After all, I didn't bring an offering, so for me to give him this food in my bag was no big deal. So I handed it to him, and he looked at me, and, and he looked at me and said, you sure you want some? And, 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 and I looked in the bag, and I looked at it, and I said, yeah, that's mom. Five little loaves and two fish. No, nah, you keep it. You keep it. And, and it, the most strangest thing began to happen. He started reaching in and pulling out fish sandwich after fish sandwich. I mean, he just kept reaching in and pulling out. It was 20 minutes and he was reaching in and pulling out. Now, I know when I gave that bag to him, there was only two fish and five loaves. But now it's 35 minutes later, and he's still reaching in and pulling out. It was the most amazing thing that you could ever begin to see. You would begin to think something crazy was going on. I mean, this was amazing. So I looked and I looked, and then it's an hour later, and he's still reaching in and pulling out. I mean, it was the most amazing thing. I know he had to pull out at least over the last 15 minutes that I was counting, he had to pull out at least 600 fish sandwiches. I mean, Mr. Mr. Peters that was just standing a few places over from me, he had ate about six fish sandwiches all by himself. And I, every time I looked, he just kept reaching in and pulling out reaching in and pulling out. And everybody around me was eating fish sandwich. Well, don't think I was left out. I mean, since I brought the thing in the first place, I decided, hey, I'm going to just get me a few fish sandwiches too. I mean, after all, it was really mine. And, 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 and when it was all over, when it was all over, now this is what really got me. This is the thing that really shook me. When I took a look at what they brought back, they brought back more than what they took out. I mean, he was still reaching in and pulling out, and they were bringing back food, saying, we don't need to feed anybody else. Everybody got what they want. Everybody have what they need. And I began thinking, and I began looking, and I began hearing, and I began seeing that something really was different about this day. See, I mean, for the first time in my life, I had really listened to the preacher. For the first time, I had gone up front. For the first time, I really wasn't dependent on anybody else. But now I saw the preacher. So on the way home, I was talking to Jill with her conservative views, and I was saying, hey, you know, he... He fed everybody. And she was like, well, where, where did he get the money from? How much money did he get? Uh, how did he feed all those people? And I said, but you should have been up front with me because, see, he had this bag and he just kept reaching in and pulling out. He just kept reaching in and pulling out. And, and, and we were there for, for about an hour and a half. And from the moment he began reaching in and pulling out, every time he reached in and pulled out, he pulled out some fish and he pulled out some bread and he pulled out more fish and he pulled out more bread and he pulled out some fish and he pulled out more bread. And, and, and I said, you should have been up there. It, it, it was amazing. And she just looked at me saying, you crazy, you crazy. And, and Simeon said, oh man, I should have had some of what you had because you had some good stuff, brother. I mean, you could see the man reaching in and pulling out. Can't nobody do that, man. Uh, can I get some of what you had? And, and we talked, and I just went home. And when I got home, I just laid in my bed, started thinking about that day, started thinking about that little white bird that woke me up before the sunrise. 
I looked at the sunrise for the first time in my life. It was the most beautiful thing you ever want to see. I remember talking to my mom and her giving me the bad news about my best friends. I just didn't understand it. But it was something different about that day. And as I began thinking and reflecting and looking and trying to get some idea of what was going on, I drifted off into sleep. A few days went by and I got the news that they were going to kill the preacher. Kill the preacher? I mean, hey, this man, different than everybody else. He, he does things that nobody else can do. So I decided I'm going to go to the preacher. I'm going to go get him. Maybe I can help. Maybe I can do something. And I began running through the town, through the dusty streets, and I began to go up hills. And by the time I got there, I saw the most horrible sight that you would ever want to see. The scene was rated R, intense violence, adult language, cruel treatment. And as I looked, he was doing the same thing that he was doing with my bag of two fish and five loaves. I saw them as they laid him down on the ground on this piece of wood. And it seemed like he was just reaching in and pulling out. Uh, they took his right hand and they laid it out and nailed him to this piece of wood. And it was like he was just reaching in and pulling out love and pulling out joy. They took his other hand and pulled it from his heart and stretched it out wide and nailed him down. But it was something amazing. I could see things a little different now. He was reaching out and pulling out love, reaching in and pulling out hope. But he wasn't just pulling out just any kind of love. He was pulling out exceeding love. He was pulling out abundance of hope. He was pulling out exceeding joy. He was pulling out a peace that passed of all understanding. He was pulling out abundant life. He just kept reaching in and pulling out, reaching in and pulling out, reaching in and pulling out. And then they lifted him up dropped him and I could hear the flesh beginning to tear. And then his eyes met my eyes like they did. He took my little bag. I know I was far away. I couldn't really get close, but it seemed like he was just looking at me. And as he was looking at me, I began to hear that bird sing again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I began to hear that bird sing and it began to fly around and I began to understand now that there was something different about this preacher, something different about what he does, something different than how he deals with life. And so now, I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, that this preacher who came from heaven to save a wretch like me has come to bring salvation to us all. And whatever you need, whenever you need it, however it's to come, he just keeps reaching in and pulling out. Reaching in and pulling out. Reaching in and pulling out. And as he begins to reach into your life, I want to let you know what he did for me. He will reach in and place love within you and pull out the hate. He will reach in and place joy and pull out the sadness. Because whatever he takes, he will give back something better. He just keeps reaching in and pulling out. Reaching in and pulling out. And so as you go through this next week, I want you to understand that you have a God who has an abundance of love, an abundance of peace, an abundance of joy, 
that he wants to give to each one of you. Love and joy and peace and happiness and contentment that will change your life. There can be something different about this day. If you just listen to the bird, hear the preacher, and let him reach in and pull out of you what he needs to do in order to make your life better. So I just ask, is there somebody this morning who desires to have God reach into their life and pull out that unnecessary mess, the junk, the stuff that doesn't need to be there and place within you that which is given. On the behalf of the officers of Allegheny West Conference, just want to say thank you to you as members of this conference for giving when you don't know what's going to happen next. I want you to recognize that we're here for a mission, a mission that has slowed us down just enough over the past five weeks to help us to focus again on what we're to do as God's remnant people. We are to share this love that just keeps reaching in and pulling out. We need to be able to share a God who gives and gives and gives so that so much giving that we recognize that we have hope. So my brothers and sisters, I just ask that once again, you would recommit yourself to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you would make a covenant with him to deal with the Simeons of this world, to deal with the Jills, the people that you may are so different from that you don't like, not to ignore the Mr. Jones who might be doing something contrary to what's happening, to the young people I say, if your mom and dad don't always come to eye to eye with what you think, recognize that Jesus is still reaching in them and pulling out. And most important of all, in each one of our lives, he is transforming and changing us. Will you change today with him? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for seeing me beyond what I can see in myself. Thank you that you spared my life to be able to have a life. So therefore, God, don't let me be judgmental on other people, but give them what I have. It might not be much, just two loaves, two fish and five loaves. It may not be something that people will understand, but I just want you to know how much I appreciate what you've done. And dear Lord, I just want to ask that you would continue to give your peace and joy to your people. Continue to bless us and keep us, I pray, in Jesus' name. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the man sat down in a number of about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fish as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. He's still reaching in and pulling out.